Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine. In today's lesson on cardiovascular physiology, I'll be discussing viscosity and turbulence. By the end of the video, you'll be able to define blood viscosity and list factors that influence it, to describe the difference between laminar and turbulent flow, to list the pathologic consequences of turbulent blood flow, and to list physiologic mechanisms for the development of heart murmurs and bruies. In the preceding video on hemodynamics, I discussed a corollary to Poissier's law that we can use to calculate resistance to fluid flow in an idealized situation. In that discussion, I mentioned a property called viscosity, which I hastily refer to as a measure of what is colloquially thought of as thickness. That was, as you might now guess, an oversimplification. In more scientific terms, Viscosity is a fluid's inherent resistance to flow secondary to internal friction, which is due to intermolecular electromagnetic forces between particles of the fluid as it flows. High viscosity fluids like syrup and molasses have a great resistance to flow, while low viscosity fluids like gasoline and water flow easily. When it comes to blood, it's a suspension of insoluble microscopic particles predominantly the red blood cells, within a relatively homogeneous solution of electrolytes, proteins, and other organic molecules. Red blood cells interact with one another, and they do not have a fixed shape. All this makes the viscosity of blood a complex topic with many different determinants. The most important of these is the hematocrit. The hematocrit is a measure of what percentage of the blood by volume is taken up by red blood cells. If we graph the relative viscosity of whole blood as a function of the hematocrit, where water is our reference, we can see that not only does increasing hematocrit lead to increased viscosity, the relationship is not linear. Viscosity begins to sharply rise once the hematocrit is above the normal range, a condition known generally as polycythemia. A similar effect can be seen in leukemia, in which the white blood cell count normally a tiny fraction of the concentration of red blood cells, can be extremely elevated. Other determinants include how deformable the RBCs are, decreased deformability, increases viscosity, as might be seen in the genetic disease sickle cell anemia, increased RBC aggregation, increases viscosity, as can be seen in inflammation, and of course, relevant also is the viscosity of the blood plasma, which is the solution in which the blood cells are suspended. The viscosity of plasma is affected by concentrations of antibodies, lipids, and a protein called fibrinogen. Pathologically elevated plasma viscosity is most well described in diseases called multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, in which there is an excessive amount of circulating immunoglobulins. There's also an interesting phenomenon that occurs in which the blood viscosity is observed to decrease when the vessel diameter drops below 300 micrometers. This is known as the farius linquest effect. In other words, the viscosity of blood is not constant as it travels through the circulation, making it a so-called non-Newtonian fluid. Viscosity is also important in determining the type of flow a fluid experiences. There are two major types of flow. One is called laminar flow, in which the fluid flows in streamlines, with each layer remaining the same distance from the vessel wall. The velocity profile during laminar flow is parabolic, meaning that fluid moves the most quickly in the center of the tube and moves the most slowly at the side. The other type of flow I've mentioned already is turbulent flow. In turbulent flow, small eddies develop in which some particles temporarily move tangentially or even backwards relative to the main direction of flow. As you may guess, turbulent flow involves much more friction and it creates significantly more resistance to flow as would be calculated from Poissier's law. To determine whether flow in a given situation is likely to be laminar or turbulent, we can calculate something called the Reynolds number, abbreviated RE. The higher the Reynolds number, the more likely flow will be turbulent. 
And I say more likely because there isn't just one discrete transition point where flow switches from fully laminar to fully turbulent, but rather there's a spectrum of fluid behaviors between those two states. There are different calculations for the Reynolds number depending on the physical situation. For a liquid moving through a tube, it's often given as the density of the liquid times its velocity times the diameter of the tube, all divided by the liquid's viscosity. But in hemodynamics, we discuss flow more often than velocity. So using a relationship we learned when discussing the continuity equation, flow through a vessel equals velocity times the vessel's cross-sectional area, and using the simplifying assumption that the cross-sectional area is a circle, and using the fact that the density of blood is more or less constant, we can rewrite this equation as the Reynolds number being proportional to the flow divided by the diameter of the blood vessel and the viscosity of blood. So in summary, in the cardiovascular system, turbulence is more likely when flow is high, the diameter of the vessel is narrow, or the viscosity of blood is low. Turbulence is relevant in cardiovascular physiology for a few reasons. One is mentioned, turbulence creates more resistance to flow. Second, turbulence in pathologic locations damages the endothelial lining of blood vessels. And third, turbulent blood flow is responsible for creating the physical exam findings of heart murmurs, which are repetitive, semi-continuous sounds audible during auscultation of the heart with a stethoscope. Turbulent flow also causes something called bruies, which are essentially just like heart murmurs, but heard best with a stethoscope over some part of the body other than the heart, such as the abdominal aorta or a carotid artery. With this knowledge, when we listen to a person's heart or blood vessel, and we hear a murmur or bruit, we can now speculate about some underlying pathology. For example, a high flow state, such as exercise, pregnancy, or sepsis, a narrow diameter for flow, as might be seen with valvular disease or a narrowing of a vessel called stenosis, decreased viscosity, as seen with anemia, and there is one other major mechanism for causing murmurs and bruits, which falls outside of the classic Reynolds number equation, irregularities in the vessel wall. For example, those seen in atherosclerosis, surface irregularities also play a role in murmurs caused by valvular heart disease. In summary, viscosity is a fluid's inherent resistance to flow. The biggest contributing factor to the viscosity of blood is the hematocrit. The Reynolds number can predict whether flow is likely to be laminar or turbulent, and there are two related formulas for the Reynolds number that are routinely applicable in cardiovascular physiology. Turbulence increases resistance to flow, damages the endothelium, and results in murmurs and bruits. And the general mechanisms behind murmurs and bruits are high flow states, decreased vessel diameter, anemia, and vessel wall irregularities. That concludes this video on viscosity and turbulence. If you found it interesting and helpful, please remember to like and share it, and consider subscribing to Strong Medicine for the rest of this ongoing series on cardiovascular physiology, as well as a diverse collection of other medical topics.